My dad comes home from prison in 2017 at the age of 100. Newsday does this huge documentary series about my dad. Something good about it, something I don't like about it. Very painful to watch. Hadn't watched the whole thing until the other day when I just, for some reason, I felt it in my heart to watch it. And you know what? Some of the misinformation that you have out there, we're going to clear it up right now. Welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is well on this end. Praise God for that. And uh, today, you know, I'm going to get into something that's uh, kind of difficult, kind of disturbing for me. Um, I'm going to do a few of these related to the Newsday documentary that was filmed and posted, I believe, about a year ago. And it was basically about my father, Sonny Francis, but there were different episodes of it. The family was involved, and I did interview it for it. My brother did interview for it. A number of other people did. FBI agents did. People associated with my dad did. They put a lot of work and effort into it. I think it was about a two- or three-year process. You know, I'm going to be honest, I didn't watch the whole thing because sometimes things about my family, they're just tough to watch, honestly. But I get asked about it all the time. People are commenting on it. People ask me questions about it. So this one is a little painful. This episode or chapter is titled, The Francis Family Falls Apart. And basically what it talks about is my dad going to prison and the impact it had on our family, obviously, in particular. And it was devastating. One of the horrors of the mob life is the fact that I don't know any family, any family of any member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated, and that includes my own. Not my wife and kids, praise God. I walked away, I've been able to, you know, preserve my family. But my mother, father, brother, sisters, disaster. My brother John, who many of you know the story, drug addict all his life, he became an informant, testified against my father, had some real difficult times. My brother was once sitting with my wife and she came to me and said, you know, your brother gave me some revelations about your childhood. And I said, what do you mean? Well, he said he doesn't understand how you, me, me, came out of that house in one piece. He said, nobody else did. The whole family is screwed up. Nobody else came out. I had a sister that died in an overdose of drugs. My brother was life was a disaster for many years. My younger sister died of cancer at a very young age. She wasn't, you know, emotionally and mentally stable. My mother, 33 years without a husband. It was a disaster. It was a bad story. It was a terrible story. I don't know how you came out of it. Well, I don't know how I came out of it either. You know, we went through some real struggles in life, a lot of challenges. It's abnormal to be in that family situation. And I don't know. But look, there's people that have things worse than me. Who knows why? You know, I thank God that I've been able to live a fairly normal life and come out of it, you know, in one piece. At least I think I have. Who knows? But I want to talk a little bit about this one, you know, and I'm going to just certain things as I was watching it that just really got my attention. They talked a lot about my father in the beginning and, you know, how the family fell apart. And there's one kind of scene in there where they say that regardless of what my father was or who he was and the things that we had experienced, in our childhood, both my brother and I decided to follow him into that life. And that's true. We both did. Despite what this life did to their father and despite what his absence did to the family, his two sons, Michael and John, willingly followed in his footsteps. Michael was a leader in the neighborhood. He coached us in the Little League. He would take us out for ice cream. And just the way he walked, talked, and acted, everybody wanted to be like Michael because of how he carried himself. Michael's a very articulate, intelligent man, and he's another man that could have made it really big in, in industry and in business, and he, he took up the life. Very much like Sonny, as, as far as his mannerisms and, and speaking. I never said to my dad, I want to be part of this life. 
You know, I told you why many times, I'm not going to be redundant, it wasn't my aspiration to be a member of the mob life, that's not what I wanted, I was going to school, I was going to be a doctor, that's what mom and dad both wanted for me, I was an athlete in school, I had no desire, no intent whatsoever to become a mobster. I loved my father, I idolized him, that was his life, I respected it, it didn't demean him in any way in my eyes. Some people say, really? Yeah, really, I love my father for who he was. And I didn't look at the other stuff, right? And he never brought what was going on in the outside world into the house. In the house, we were family. Obviously, I witnessed a lot of stuff, you know, all these arrests and everything going on. But I wanted to help my dad. And my dad just thought that if I was going to leave school and I was going to help him get out of prison on a bum rap, a rap that he was framed in, that I would be better suited to do that as a member of his life. He knew I had it in me, so he proposed me. My brother John, a little different situation. He did follow into that life in a way, but he had a severe drug problem. And I can tell you this, you can't have a severe drug problem and be part of that life. It's not going to work. Eventually, you're going to suffer some severe consequences. It just won't work. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. I can confess this to you. There was a point in time when my dad came to me and he said, we want to straighten your brother out. I was already a made guy. He said, I want you to propose him. And I looked at my father. I said, Dad, do you really understand what's going on with your son, my brother? I said, he's a drug addict. I said, you want to propose him into this life? You're going to get him killed. And he said, well, you know, and he started to dance a little bit. And I understand that's his son, you know, and my brother, we loved him. He wasn't suited for this life. And I said, Dad, you know, in all due respect, I love you. I do anything you ask me, but this is my brother and I will not propose him. I'm not going to put him in jeopardy. And if you do it, that's up to you, but I will not do it. And, uh, and I didn't. And I heard that my father did propose him. I don't know that for a fact. I don't know it formally. If that happened, it happened after I had already made the decision to walk away from that life. And I still disagree with it. And I think my brother right now would disagree with it. And I want to tell you something else about my brother. You know, it's easy to criticize somebody when you've never walked in their shoes. And I mean that. Now, look, I don't agree with what my brother did, turning against my father like that. But I've listened to him. He's my brother. I love him. Yeah, you can call him a rat. Everybody's a rat, according to all the internet, social media warriors. But again, they never walked in anybody else's shoes. And they just use that term that they hear in the movies or on the street and all that kind of stuff. And I did a video on that to try to clarify that. Not going to get into it again. But I understand some of the difficulties that my brother went through. I don't agree with what he did. I'm going to tell you right now that he could have handled it in a different way. I don't agree with what he did. I don't justify it. But in a way, I can understand. I lived in that house. I know what he went through. I know what my sister, who eventually died of an overdose, went through. I know what my mother went through. And I got to tell you, for many, many, many years, I was against my mother in her attitude with my father. And it wasn't until... You know, my mom passed away months before she passed away that her and I really had some down to earth talks that we hadn't had in the past that I started to understand a little more. And, you know, there was something that was revealed in this series that I don't know that it's true or not. I can't I can't tell you for a fact that it is. But my mother was 16 years old when I was born and when she was involved with my dad. And it came out in the series through the reporter that did this, that my mom never knew my father was married and had three children before she married him. Tina thought she was marrying this older, glamorous, and wealthy man, and she was. But when they got back from their honeymoon, she found out something else. She found out that he had three children from his first marriage, and she was expected to take care of them. That lie and all the lies that follow set the stage for anger, resentment, and physical and emotional abuse at home. The pressure of mob life became too much for her. I don't know that to be true. That was revealed in this series. I heard it for the first time. If it was true, uh, that's a terrible thing. I mean, if my father was dishonest with my mother to that degree, that she was marrying someone that was married before and had three children that she was unaware of, that's not cool and it's unacceptable. And again, 
I don't know if it's true or not, but it was revealed in this series. It kind of made me think of things a little bit differently because I always sided with my dad. I don't want to say against my mother, but I don't know. Maybe it was the guy thing. Maybe it was this bond that I had with my dad in so many ways. But, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm guilty for that feeling. I really don't feel good about it. But like I said, you know, my mom and I, we patched up a lot of things between us in the months before she passed away from cancer in 2012. But anyway, in this particular clip, it talks about me and my brother, rather, following my father, even though we knew who he was, what he did, and why? Well, I don't know. I mean, I can't explain it. I did it, like I said, to help my father, not so much to follow him, but to help him. It wasn't that, hey, dad, make me a mob guy. No, if being a mob guy is going to help you get out of prison, because I know you were framed, I'll take that to my grave, people. No matter what, my dad was framed. I said, if that's going to help you get out of jail so you don't die in prison, well, sign me up. I'm ready to go. My brother, again, a little bit differently. I don't want to speak to him. But he had too many problems. The drug thing was just too, just took over his life. And for those of you that have ever had that problem or witnessed somebody that had the problem or had it, unfortunately, in your family, you know what I'm talking about. You just don't think straight. You can't function properly. It's just a nightmare. And I've said it so many times, you know, if you're involved in that in any way, please go get help. Help yourself. Get out of it because you're destroying your life. No doubt about it. But, you know, in this particular clip, some of the FBI agents go on to try to explain, you know, why I followed my dad. They said I was very much like him. You know, they gave me some compliments. I'm not going to say it. You can listen to what they had to say about how I held myself and carried myself and how in many ways I was much like my father. And I guess, honestly, I liked hearing that. You know, you like when people, even your enemies, FBI agents, are talking well about you. But I guess it just made me think, you know, why, why we both, me and my brother, followed my dad into that life. There's another clip in there that really got my attention. And more or less, people, because, look, there's a lot of chatter on the Internet. There's a lot of guys that are up there now um, that all of a sudden become mob experts. And they talk about people and they, you know, say things and they, they make assumptions or they say things as fact that they don't really know a fact. And I'm not going to name names. It's not important. It's a lot of stuff going on. Hey, that's social media. You know, everybody has a forum. They can say or do what they want, whether it's true or not. And I think people know that. And there's a lot of misinformation. There's misinformation about me also. You know that I don't respond to any of this stuff. I really don't. Because why should I? I know who I am. I know what I did. And so do the right people. Uh, and the documentation that supports that. So there's really nothing for me to defend in these things, but it's in this clip, so I'll talk about it. So how did Michael Francis first come across your radar? The FBI was interested in Michael Francis as a target. Uh, Michael had inherited much of what his father was doing. Uh, he was sophisticated, he was smart, beginning to make money through illegal means, uh, through the infiltration of insurance companies, the oil and gas industry, the entertainment business, which his father had been involved in, and it went on and on and on. At that time, there was no other scam, I would say, that was bringing in as much money as gas. That's it. I was giving a family $2 million a week at times. That money doesn't come from anywhere else, trust me. I don't know if Al Capone made that kind of money. That's some serious, serious money. You know, I became a major target of law enforcement myself. I was indicted several times. Two federal racketeering indictments, one brought on by Giuliani. Anton Volucas, he called me up and, you know, said, hey, congratulations, you, know, you did a great job in convicting Michael Francis, but he's cooperating with us and, you know, we're going to come into New York and we're going to support his motion for a reduced sentence. And I said, no, you know, I just, I just, you're going to be completely nuts. <laughs> you know, Norby Walt is dumb cut it. You know, he's able to give up call my purse ago and he probably sat down with God and, and, and Fat Tony Salerno and, and, and Chin Giganti. I mean, Michael was up there in the leadership of the, the, the uh, Colombo crime family, and he was a huge earner, and he had the ability to give us all sorts of very significant people. The reporter who's doing this asked Ed McDonald, head of the Organized Crime Strike Force, my prosecutor, when did Michael Francis first come on your radar? And he starts to explain, you know, that Michael started to become active. The FBI had him 
under investigation, which was true. I was under investigation or surveillance from the time I was 20 years old, when I first became a recruit, 21, whatever that was. They brought it to the attention of the organized crime strike force, Ed McDonald, Eastern District of New York, before it even went to Giuliani on that other case. They go on to describe, you know, Rob Lewicki, who was uh, an FBI agent at the time, He makes a statement that in the gas business, I was making very serious money. Ed McDonald says I was into a lot of different things, insurance scams, the gas business, automobile, and he starts to break it down. And the reason I'm saying this, this is all a matter of record. What I did in that life is a matter of record. I don't have to, you know, search for things. It's all there. Now, this is the head of the strike force saying these things. These are FBI agents saying these things. There was one interesting part there, and I'm going to respond to this because so many people, Norby Walters and Michael, you're a rat, and you testified, and you cooperated with the government, and all I ever said, and I will say this, and I'll take it to my grave, and I will, again, I will challenge anybody to bring anything forward credible that says anything different. You know why I could challenge it? It doesn't exist. So... They talk about the Norby Walters thing. And Ed McDonald, head of the strike force, says he got a call from Anton Volukas. Anton Volukas was the head of the U.S. attorney in Chicago. In that case, I testified in the Norby Walters case. And I will tell you this. I knew exactly what I was doing when I testified in that case. And I will say this again. Norby Walters never spent one day in prison. There is some talk on the internet, I saw it in comments, that I ordered Norby Walters' murder and that he's dead. Correction, Norby Walters is alive and well. Actually, in this clip at some point in time, the reporter calls Norby Walters and asks him for a comment, and he declined. He wouldn't talk about me, my father, or my brother. He declined comment. He's alive and well and living in Southern California. So, okay, that's another fallacy. More misinformation online. Anton Volukas tells Ed McDonald that he's going to support a sentence reduction for me if I ask for one. Sentence reduction. Now, remember, I already done five years in prison. I was already in prison. No cooperation involved in that. It was a plea agreement. Uh, You know, I got 10-year sentence, $15 million restitution, went off to do my time. I was subpoenaed in the Norby Walters case, and I decided, okay, put me on the stand. Half the stuff they asked me about with Norby, I didn't know. I was in jail all the time this stuff was going on. All I was told is, Norby Walters is using your name to threaten college athletes. And I said, well, that's not true. I'm in jail. I didn't threaten anybody. I don't know what he's doing. I'm here in prison. And they were also talking about my father and my brother. And I said, look, I'll tell you what I know. I said, but it's not that much. And I knew what I was doing in the Norby Walters case. Now, Anton Beluka said, hey, if he goes in for a sentence reduction, I'll support it. Ed McDonald says, heck no. We're not supporting any sentence reduction for Michael Francis. Norby Walters, he laughs at it. Who cares about Norby Walters? Exactly. Nobody cared. I saved his life. My father was going to kill him. Corky Vastola was going to kill him. Carmine Persico wanted to kill him. Norby was alive because of me. He knows that. That's why I won't make a comment. That's why he didn't get mad even at the trial. And Norby Walters never did one day in jail. Not one. I don't think he did an hour in prison. Remember that. Okay? So now, and McDonald laughs. He said, are you kidding? Francis could have given up Persico could give up Fat Tony Salerno, could give up Chin Gigante. He named all the bosses. He says Francis was high up there in the Colombo family. But what happened? Never gave up any of those people. Not one of them went to jail for me. Not one of them had an issue in any way, shape, or form because of me. But there's the head of the organized crime strike force telling everybody, hey, I could have given up all of these people. And you know what? He's right. He was right. I was involved with all of them. You know, Persico is my boss. Chin Giganti, I met with him. I knew all of these people. Did I want to put them in prison? No. It's not who I was. It's not who I am now. It's not who I was back then. But here, you got the FBI, and you got the head of the organized crime strike force in the Eastern District of New York saying the same thing. And by the way, Ed McDonald was the one that put me in jail. And he's the one that's saying, I could have hurt everybody, but I didn't. So let's put that to rest. To Frankie Camp, if I was Sonny, I would get my son over here, Michael, and I would kill him. I would kill him. 
all right, your son's a rat, and if you ain't gonna do it, get somebody else to do it. I remember clear as day. Now, Frank Campion took a little lighter view of that. He said, well, he goes, Chicky, he goes, well, who did he really hurt? Michael, that is, Michael, who did he really hurt? And so, Ch and uh, Chicky said, I don't care. You kill your son, specifically, I remember those three, kill your son. Frankie Camp at the ball field said Michael didn't hurt anybody, but John's wiring up obviously led to a number of uh, indictments, arrests, convictions, and he ended up testifying against his own father. Another scene in this documentary that, quite honestly, I had never saw before. You know, I didn't watch this when it came out. I don't watch a lot of things about, you know, my family. It's just, it's painful, honestly, and I don't want to watch it. But just the other day, it caught my attention for whatever reason, and I started watching it. And this clip, very, very important because the internet, you know, uh, experts out there uh, who try for some reason, I don't know these people, I have no clue who they are, I've never had any involvement with them whatsoever, but somehow they get offended when I talk on here, I don't know, whatever their motivation is, uh, have tried to say that Frankie Camp, Frankie Campione, that he went to prison because of me. He took a plea because of me because he didn't want to face me on trial. I don't know where that came from. Totally untrue. I can tell you this. Frankie Campione had three cases, three separate indictments, having nothing to do with me. And as a result, the government made him a deal. They wrapped everything up and gave him three years. Why wouldn't you take a deal like that? Three separate cases. You don't have to go to trial. You don't have to pay his lawyers. Three years, he gets out, you know, after, uh, you know, 85% of his time. It was a home run for him. But now just to verify, had nothing to do with me. But just to verify that in this clip, Robert Lewicki, who is the agent investigating Frankie Camp and this other guy, Chicky Lito, who I knew, didn't care for, we'll leave it at that. There was a tape on the two of them. And in that tape, Chicky Lito is telling Frankie Camp, you can listen to it, if I was Sonny Francis, I would kill Michael Francis, he's a rat, I would kill him. Now, I know why he said that, but, you know, whatever. I mean, there was a past experience with me and Chicky when he was nobody in that life. And he's very adamant about it. And he's telling this to Frankie Camp. And Frankie Camp, the guy that I allegedly caused to take a plea and go to prison, says... But who did Michael really hurt? Now, if I had heard him, wouldn't he say, yeah, Michael put me in prison too? Quote, who did Michael really hurt? That's Frankie Camp, the guy I allegedly gave information and put him in prison. So much misinformation. You know, unfortunately, Frankie Camp is dead now. And you know what? He was a friend of mine. I like Frankie. I can tell you a whole story about Frankie. Good stuff. He drove my dad around. I think he later turned against my dad in some way. That's what I heard. I was already out of the life. I don't know, but who knows? That's what happens in that life, okay? Not a big issue at this moment. Not important. What is important is what he said, but who did Michael really hurt? End of story there. The next clip, it goes on to see a newspaper, Newsday, front page, front page with my picture, and in the uh, headline it says, how he left them hanging. And if you go on to read the article, basically, I told him nothing. I told him nothing. I tried to outsmart them. In the end, I won and I lost. I won in that I didn't put anybody in prison. You know, I did my thing. I'm not going to get into all the details on how I was able to maneuver that. But in the end, they put me back in prison. Had a parole violation. I got four years. They tried to indict me on another case. It didn't happen. Praise God. The case fell apart. But I spent four more years in prison, 29 months and seven days in solitary. Six by eight cell, 24-7. Me and God is the way I say it. So I paid the price for trying to manipulate the government, not hurt anybody, outsmart them. I put myself back in prison, but nobody went to jail because of anything that I said. And I'll stand by that. And again, I'm only clarifying things. People are still going to call me whatever they call me. That's okay. I know who I am and I know how I live with myself and so on and so forth. So, but I think it was important. Again, I didn't even know this existed. I would have said it probably a long time ago. This thing is out well over a year.
Uh, just my, uh, my final analysis, I would say, of this episode of this documentary. Comments all over the place, misinformation. I never visited my father. Totally untrue. I have pictures with my father, wheeling him in his wheelchair, talking to him, having lunch with him, taking him to a restaurant with other people, you know. But everybody says, you know, or online people say, well, you never visited your father. You never go back to New York because you're afraid. I've been back to New York a hundred times. I have two daughters back there. I have grandchildren back there. I've spoken at churches back there. I've had business dealings back there. I go back to New York all the time. And I visited my father all the time while he was there. Good morning. Um, you can take a real good look at me. I'm probably the most blessed, most fortunate person that's ever going to walk up here and speak to you about anything. I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. And quite honestly, that's what I deserved. This last clip, it shows me in a church in Long Island. Last time I looked, Long Island is in New York. That's where my headquarters were for much of the time that I spent on the street. And I'm speaking at a church. Now, you don't have to listen to all of this, but you can watch it. I'm sure it's up there. And you know what, people? I'll go back to a church anytime on Long Island. I'll go to a church almost anywhere in the world. And I've been to over 1,600 already where I've shared my testimony. And the reason I can do that, even in New York, is because I believe that God had a different plan and a purpose for me. And over the past 25 years, he's made it very, very clear to me. So whether it be in New York or Singapore or Australia or any place in Europe that I visited or every city in the United States, that's right, every major city in the United States over the past 25 years, I have visited for one purpose or another, whether I'm giving my testimony or speaking to pro athletes or visiting a university, whatever else I have been privileged and honored to do throughout my life, throughout this second phase of my life, that's what I do. And I will be back in New York. I was in uh, New Jersey a couple of weeks ago or at the Sopranos Con. I go back there quite often. So again, dispelling the myths and the misinformation that you hear. It's not only me, you know, for me, it just happens to be documentation to the contrary. I'm sure there's misinformation about a lot of people out there, but hopefully this clarifies a couple of things. Again, I don't know, you know, how one thing led into another, but watching this entire series has been difficult for me. You know, seeing my dad, knowing the life that he led, knowing the struggles and challenges that he had, knowing how he passed away, the 40 years he did in prison, knowing the suffering and challenges my mother went through, even my brother. And again, you could call him what you want, but you haven't walked in his shoes. Remember that. My sister, my younger, you know, just a lot of trouble. So it's hard to look at this thing. And that's why I praise God every single day for giving me my freedom, my life, a family that I love, the ministry that I was blessed with, and the ability to move around and do what I believe God wants me to do in my life. Not perfect, but I do my best. That's it for today. So what else can I say? Um, you know, sometimes I get a little emotional about these things, but it's very, very close to home. But anyway, let me leave you like I always leave you. And by the way, if you feel that I can be a benefit to you in any way, you've heard this a thousand times, I'll say it again, join.michaelfrancis.com. Join the crew. Leadership skills. You want to know how to get through struggles and challenges in life. You want to brush up on some business skills that I can probably provide. Let me know. That's what I'm here for. I've been doing it for 25 years. Now we have a platform to really do it effectively and reach a lot of people. And I'm telling you, people are being blessed. They're loving it. They're getting so much out of it. I encourage you, join.michaelfrancis.com. And how do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy, God bless, and yep, God willing, I'll see you next time. Take care.